I am SD Shepard over here on Twitch, here with Paul W.S. Anderson, the director for the Monster Hunter movie. Paul, how are you doing today? I'm doing bloody marvelous, thank you. Wow, this is just fantastic. <laughs> to think that A, there is a Monster Hunter movie, and B, we get to talk to the director is, uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun and it's a great honor. Um, so I'm if it's okay with Yeah, if it's okay with you, Paul, I think we're gonna get right into the questions, if that's okay. Great. Okay, all right. So starting with the movie, um, you know, why start off our main character real world, right? So Mia's character, Artemis, um, why in the real world and not in the world of Monster Hunter? Well, um, that's a very good question. And uh, my answer to that would be, you know, when you play the game, you, you don't play an existing character. You create your own character, you create your own avatar, and then you go into the world. And in many ways, you know, the Mila character is the avatar that we follow. It's the, the avatar that the viewers follow, just as you would follow the adventures of your own character that you created. You follow the adventures of this new character that happens to appear in a movie rather than in a video game. And uh, for me, that gave me two advantages as a filmmaker. One is it, it reproduced the feeling that I had as a gamer when I first played the game. Because of course, when you first play the game, you know nothing about the world. You're kind of a newbie. You're coming to it fresh. And I played the game 12 years ago in Japan and I was just blown away by it. I mean, these amazing creatures, the landscapes, the ecosystem that they live in, it was just fantastic. And I, I really had this sense of wonder I would say, at how awesome it all was. And I wanted to recreate that for the movie. And I think to have that sense of wonder, you, you have to see the world through fresh eyes. You have to see it through the eyes of a newbie. And that's why, you know, I, I brought in a fresh character. Well, that's fair enough. The uh, director of the video game, Ryozo Sujimoto, has often said that you are the hero, uh, speaking to the player. So I guess you do need a little, little bit of an abstraction, right? So... That, well, that exactly. Does make sense, yeah. I mean, that's that's it. That that was our approach, and you know, for the gamers, it recreates the feeling you first had when you yeah. played the game. Because of course, right. you come to the game, you know, you're a, you're a modern person. You know, you're sitting at your computer, you're drinking your coffee, you know, you're eating your pizza, you're microwaved. You know, you're you're a modern day person, and you're going into this amazing world. You know, that's that's the trajectory that you follow when you follow Mila's character in this movie. Um, so it kind of recreates the sense of wonder you have for a gamer playing for the first time. But then also for an audience that doesn't know anything about the video game, they don't feel excluded because they have a way into the world. Sure. Well, um, of course, starting that, you know, we are in the real world. Um, we could have had her character be anything, right? Could have been a librarian, a chef or anything. Why did you feel it was important to give her a role in the military? Well, it, it kind of came organically based on what, where Monster Hunter had been before. Um, I was very influenced by a crossover that Monster Hunter had done with Metal Gear Solid. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> where you, you know, and, and that, that already existed. It's part of the kind of mythology of the game. And, and I thought this is great imagery to kind of juxtapose, you know, a man with a machine gun and against the creatures. And also I thought what fun to kind of play with the hubris of the modern world in that the, you know, we put our faith in technology so much, in fact, too much in my opinion. Um, and of course, you know, in the movie, it doesn't go so well. So these people who like have all these weapons and all these vehicles, you know, it, it, they just get, end up getting fucked up, pardon my French, um, because, you know, all of their technology that they put their faith in is geared towards killing people, not killing these giant creatures. So, you know, this character who thinks they know everything and are, they're, they're a skilled warrior, you know, has to be kind of like taught how to how to fight again, how to be a warrior again, how to become a hunter. And of course, that lesson is delivered by somebody who, you know, is from the Monster Hunter world, Tony Jaa's character, and then also uh, Ron Perlman's character, the Admiral. And I thought that was that was kind of fun because in many ways, I think the Monster Hunter world is better than our world. You know, it's a it's a more ecological world. You know, the the creatures are killed, yes, but then you use every part of the creatures. You use them to you eat them, you craft with them. Um, so all of that, I think, is is quite admirable as opposed to our world where we just throw so much away and yeah. there's so much waste. Um, so I thought again that was a, an interesting aspect of the movie, which follows one of the themes of the video game. 
Yeah, no, it's definitely a bit of a utopia. And you absolutely earned a thousand points pulling off that bizarre trivia from Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker <laughs> with Big Boss shooting uh, missiles at Rathalos and human slingshots at T-Rex. So very good to anyone. Well, uh, you know, it wasn't, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't take credit for it. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of greater men. What can I yeah. say? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there have been reports that Mila's been a fan of of Monster Hunter for a while. She's she actually she likes the game. She plays the game regularly. And and I, I read an article saying that that was the reason why she chose the dual blades as her primary weapon. Um, was that always her first choice, or did you guys experiment with her like swinging a hunting horn around or anything else like that? <laughs> well, she's known about the game for a long time because I, you know, I've been involved in the world of Monster Hunter for 12 years now. That's how long ago oh, wow. I, I played I played the game. Yeah. And then I actively started pursuing Capcom with the idea of turning it into a movie 11 years ago. So it's really been a, a decade long quest for me. Um, and uh, so Mila's known about it. And then once we started talking about making the movie, of course, she really got into it. And she started playing Monster Hunter World. And uh, yeah, she she experimented with all the other weapons. But um, for her, you know, the speed and the agility that she has as a, just as a regular person in life, kind of is reflected in the way that she moves her character when she's using her avatar. And uh, she just felt the dual blades was something that, you know, she could do maximum damage with while also moving around really quickly. Because of course the bigger weapons, yeah. you know, they're very, you know, you do a lot of damage, but they're very heavy. You know, it's more her style, you know, the kind of stick and move. You didn't need any stunt training. You just gave her the weapons. You just sent her out. She just immediately knew she's, how to do every uh, move naturally. <laughs> listen, she she trains a lot for every movie yeah. she's done, and this yeah. movie was no exception. Yeah, yeah. And she trained a lot with those weapons um, because you know, obviously, Tony, Tony and Ron had a harder harder job because their weapons are very very sure. outsized. The great sword, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, Tony's got the great sword, and also at one point he has the great bow as well. So, uh, you know, just when Tony had mastered the great sword, which was not easy, I then gave him the great bow and say, you have yeah. to use this yeah. in the same scene at the same time. And then, and then we upped the ante when we actually shot the movie as well, that we're shooting in, you know, very difficult locations for them, you know, on real rocky terrain, uh, in real sand, you know, with, with real, real hot African sun and real dusty African dust, you know, this was not a movie that was shot on a studio back lot. So, you know, the weaponry and the heaviness of the weaponry became even more difficult as we kind of went along. If you had a cameo in the movie, what weapon would you use? <laughs> uh, uh, well, a giant bow gun. <laughs> giant bow gun, giant Heavy bow gun, gun, right? The large Heavy one. Heavy bow gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I love I love the heavy bow gun because that's that's more my style. You know, Mila's in there, kind of like close quarter combat. I'm more kind of like staying in the background. I'm probably not as brave as she is. That's the truth of it. Me either. Um, I'd stay far away. <laughs> and, and the, you know, and it also I I just love the heavy bow gun. It's a fantastic piece of equipment, and uh, it's it and it always makes me, it's funny when I, I hear fans complain that there's no projectile well there's no projectile weapons in Monster Hunter, and I'm like, well, heavy bow gun, baby. You know, this, yeah. this thing's pretty mean. Um, yeah, I like it a lot. And also it kind of, I was always fascinated in Monster Hunter about the kind of technology in the world. Because on the one hand, it's a kind of like, um, it's, a, it's almost like a dark ages world where people have swords and shields. Um, but then it also has hints of a more advanced technology. You know, they have airships and they have the heavy bow gun as well. And, uh, you know, that, that to me kind of speaks to a civilization that was more advanced and has fallen backwards slightly, which kind of ties into this kind of rather mysterious ancient civilization idea that runs through a lot of the games that I've always been um, very, very taken with. You know, the idea that there was a more advanced technological civilization that fell into ruins. And now you're kind of operating in a world where some of that technology still exists and works, but a lot of it has kind of fallen into rack and ruin. Yeah, no, I think that resonates with a lot of people. And I think that element of mystery, I think it really makes it a, a great setting. And, and speaking of which, that's a great segue. Um, this is not your first video game adaptation you've ever made before. Um, talk a little bit about why you seem to revisit video games as a setting for uh, your movies over the years. Well, you know, some some directors love love the theater and they go to the theater a lot and they adapt theatrical stage plays or musical theater or whatever. I, 
I hate going to the theater, so I'm never <laughs> going to do that. But I love playing video games and I always have. So kind of it's a more natural thing for me to, it's a more natural genre for me to work in. Um, listen, I've been a fan of video games since I saw the first um, Space Invaders game. And that was a long time ago. And uh, it was in a pinball arcade. And uh, one time I went to my favorite arcade and all the kids, no one was playing pinball anymore. Everyone was clustered around this black monolith in the corner of the arcade. And it was the very first Space Invaders machine. And, you know, and from that point onwards, I was, I was hooked. Yeah, you don't really see arcades much anymore, unless, of course, you're in Japan, right? It's that that style of gaming would completely go over, I think, a lot of people's heads. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's kind of disappeared, which is a real shame. Um, but you know, I think interestingly in Asia, you know, everyone is is into a kind of more communal experience uh, playing games. You know, there's a lot of cooperative games, um, and and also just being with other people while you play as well, which can be really fun. Yeah. I certainly enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, are you a big gamer now? Do you still play games? Well, I, I've discovered that there's an inverse relationship between the amount of kids you have and the amount of gaming you get to do. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I was, uh, I was a much bigger gamer. You know, like the, the days when I, you know, could play Resident Evil for days on end. You know, which is how I kind of discovered Resident Evil, which is why I became involved in that franchise. You know, I, I I had the luxury that I could just disappear into you know my apartment and and grow a beard and and stay up all night and play games. If I'm going to stay up all night nowadays, it's usually kind of because the baby's cranky and oh, need to diaper oh, changing. No. So uh, so the game playing you know has has taken a back seat a little bit, but I have to say it's one of the best things in the world because um, now I can justify playing games because I'm adapting them into movies. Sure. So, you know, my, my kids, like our eldest, we limit the amount of uh, time she can have in front of a computer. Um, like a lot of kids, you know, there's, there's a, there's a set time and what she does with her time is up to her. But when, when it's over, that's it. So she would come up to me and Mila and go, you know, mom and dad, you know, you just tell me I can't play games and you're just playing these games for hours on end. We're like, baby, this is work. You know, mommy and daddy need to, <laughs> I need to do my research. Yeah, excellent. Well, then maybe the hardest question of of the night will be, if you can remember, what was the last game you played and finished? So you got to the credits, if you can remember. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> you know, it's so rare now that I can dedicate that much time. I mean, yeah. I, I, I dive into games with great enthusiasm, but actually having the time to get all the way to the end of them, um, that's, a, that's a real challenge. Um, you know, I'm more... Now, to be honest, it's more tablet games. Sure. I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm back playing the things I played when I was a teenager. You know, it's all kind of uh, Frogger and Space Invaders. And, you to know, be fair, you can't beat these, those. These you just things, get your score higher and higher, right? You just go cent, forever. Centipede. Centipede yeah. is great. You know, yeah. um, Galaxia. Sure. You know, all those arcade favorites. I love playing those. Well, fair enough. So, you know, you said you've played Monster Hunter. You said your first one, I think, was 12 years ago? 12 years ago, yes. Do you remember which one you that know, would have been then? I mean, it was 12 years ago. There's a lot of, uh, lot of movies and the kids under one. the bridge, the bridge um, since then. Do you have a but favorite was, memory from it, from when you played it for the first time? It was, it, was, it was falling in love with the creatures and the landscapes. I mean, they were just so gorgeous. And what really impressed me is what... Um, Fujioka-san and Tsujimoto-san have done is they've created a complete living ecosystem that you really believe. You know, the monsters, you believe they're living in these environments and interacting with them. And, um, you know, that really deeply impressed me when I played the game for the first time. And I also felt, you know, you could tell it was a Japanese game because I'm just a huge fan of Japanese design. And uh, the creatures just looked so amazing. I mean, and I, I, for me as a movie fan, I thought, well, here's an opportunity to make a monster movie where no one has seen these creatures before. Right? Unless you've kind of played the games, you know, these are fresh looking creatures. You know, the Diablos, the Nasilla, these monsters just look so unlike anything else I've seen. Um, but that was what really hooked me. I thought, you know, if this, if we can do this on a big screen on an IMAX screen, people are going to go crazy for it. Yeah. I mean, the, the designs are endlessly creative and they put so much detail 
into everything about their monsters in their world. Like it, it makes it hard playing other games sometimes because it's like nobody else, I think, puts that much thought and care into that world and that universe. Well, and also, you know, a lot of games focus on the, you know, on the creatures and the action, but, you know, the, just the environment is so mm-hmm. well rounded and so well portrayed in these games. And that's why, you know, I made the decision when we shot the movie that we're not going to shoot this on a studio back lot. We're not going to shoot against a green screen. You know, we're not going to create these environments in a computer because that it's very hard to make that real. You know, it just all feels synthetic. And when you're playing the game, you lose yourself. You're immersed in this world. And I thought I want the the same for the audience coming to see the movie. So I really knew that I had to create these ga- the, these landscapes on real locations. You know, we had to go out and we had to shoot them for real and capture them for real, which is not easy because the landscapes in the game are stunning. So we, you know, we spent a good six months traveling around the world and kind of looking for the the most appropriate epic landscapes we could find. And then we found a lot of them like in the middle of nowhere in in Africa. So we ended up with the entire cast and crew living in these tent villages while we were shooting because we were hundreds of miles from the nearest habitation. Uh, So we had 350 people living in tents. You know, we tried, you know, we piped in water, we had electricity, we dig our own wells. I mean, it was real... We should have done a reality show while we we're out there because that's kind of what it felt like. You are but, already living Monster Hunter. <laughs> well, it, it kind of felt like that. You know, we we're off in these camps and everyone, it built a lot of camaraderie between the cast and the crew. And, um, you know, the good thing was that we we just captured these landscapes for real. And that, I think when people see the movie will be really, really impressive. You know, these incredible um, rock formations and uh you know one of my favorite locations is the wild spire wastes and i really wanted to kind of like bring that to life yeah the the enormous ant piles that build up into these pillars all over the place and you get an occasional splash of green but otherwise this enormous rocky terrace and stuff like that um do you did you find yourself actually speaking with the creators on a regular basis going back and forth maybe comparing how you were shooting yeah Absolutely. I mean, it's it's something I knew from the first point I played the game 12 years ago was I was going to be as slavishly accurate as I could, because why not? You know, the world they created was just so good and the creatures were so stunning. I didn't want to take any liberties with it. So, you know, we consulted regularly with uh, Sujimoto san and Fujioka san about pretty much every aspect of the movie. You know, they read the scripts, they um, gave notes. Uh, they looked at all the costumes that we were designing because we wanted to make them as close to the game as possible. Um, we, all of the monster designs, obviously, they were heavily involved in. They saw the location photographs. They gave great detail when it came to the creatures, you know, that I really wanted to get super accurate. So the way we worked was we started with the models from the video game, actually. So they would they would give us the the three-dimensional models from the video game. So from the ground up, we were building on the bones of what they had already created. Um, So we got the geometry of the creatures correct. And then we would layer our detail on top of that. Um, But sometimes, you know, when you, you make a movie, you're obviously making it in much greater detail than when you make a video game, just because the video game engine is different to, you know, what what you, the tools you're using for making a film. So you can go into greater detail, but sometimes the detail is not so obvious from the video game because there's motion blur. And so, um, you know, I would then, having built the creatures as accurately as I thought possible, I would then go back um, to the creators and say, what do you think? You know, uh, be honest. And, and they would be brutally sometimes. And, you know, and it went, it, we, we, every note we got um, from Fujioka-san and Sujimoto-san, we executed because I really wanted to make them happy because I thought if I make them happy, I, I make the fans happy as well because these are the gatekeepers to the world. And, you know, if I can please them, I can please everybody else. Absolutely. Would you say um, even beyond the visual design, you worked with them pretty closely on the sound design as well? Because I, I do know from the, the official trailer, the Diablos roar sounds spot on. Is that from yes. the game or was that re-recorded or, or how it's, did you guys do that? It's from the game uh, with a slight bit of re-recording, but it's it's as accurate as we could get it. You yeah. know, obviously, because, you know, the game, you're listening to it in a different way. In a theater, when you've got like a, an Atmos mix, you need slightly different sound levels. Yeah. Um, but everything is as close as we could possibly get it. Um, I remember Fujioka-san was very specific about the tone of muscular chef's voice. 
<laughs> you know, so we pitched it up, we pitched it down until we got it just right. It was like, you know, it was like the baby bear's porridge, you know, it was yeah. just, just right. And, um, and I'll never forget, I'd, I'd flown to Tokyo with a lot of the footage to, uh, to show to Sujimoto and Fujioka-san. And, uh, you know, they, they looked at the first scene where Mila sees the Diablos for the first time. And it bursts out of the ground. It's super dramatic. And you think it's going to, like, just kill everybody. And it's, it's a great moment in the movie. And Fujioka-san had me stop. And he said, no, no, no. The, the fingernails of the creature, they're not right. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, this is, this is incredible detail we're going into here. I mean, I'm like, I'm thinking it's going to bite Mila's head off and crush everybody. But he was like, no, the fingernails, you've, you've got them too pointy because the creature burrows through the sand, they should be more rounded. So, uh, you know, we took the note, we went back, we changed the look of the, the claws on the creature. And, um, you know, for, for fans who want to go into really, really fine detail like that, you know, that fine detail is there to be found. Yeah, I mean, some of those details, they, they do matter within the, the context of the game. And of course, Diablos can fly a little bit, but mostly it's going around all underneath you. You don't really know where it's going to go or, or how it's going to show up. Yeah, so. that's one of the things that appealed to me about that creature is you're not quite sure where it's going to pop up. You know, it's um, so you can play with the tension a lot. And also, you know, for, for people who've never played the game, there's also this great mystery of what the hell is that thing? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I do know that that Tony Jaws character, the hunter, I think, is, is how he's referred to in the movie or or however he's attributed. The Diablos is like one of his first big scenes. He's there helping helping fight it. Um, what was it like working with him? I mean, did you learn anything from each other? Because I know he brings like a crazy level of like practical, you know, martial arts and action to to whatever movie he's on. It was a it was a dream working with Tony. It was uh it was I've wanted to work for him with him for for such a long time. Um, you know, I huge fan of his from on on back onwards. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, he's he's a man who basically reinvented kind of Asian action cinema, you know, just going, you know, I don't need those wires. I'll just do it for real. Oh. So it was it was a real treat. You know, this is a man who like literally just does, does backflips for fun. And, um, <laughs> Tony, was, we need to was, shoot. Stop flipping. <laughs> it was great to have him. And I, I, I honestly feel like without him, we really have struggled to make the movie because, as you know, one of the key one of the one of the key things people associate with Monster Hunter are these oversized weapons, which it was, it was very important for me to get the weapons right. Again, that's something I consulted with the creators with endlessly about the fine detail of the, the weaponry. But, you know, it's, it's a different thing. You know, it's one thing playing with these weapons when you're playing a video game and your avatar is made out of pixels and there's no real law of gravity. And then it's another thing when you make them for real and you want a human being to kind of swing them around. And uh, I, I was very, very impressed with what Tony managed to do for real with these weapons. You know, the, 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 the sword is almost as big as he is. I mean, it's huge. And it was heavy as well. And within minutes, he was like twirling it around. He was doing amazing stuff with it. You know, and then we just made it, we made it harder and harder for him, you know, because then we, then we gave him the bow. Right. And then we said, and, and you have to do all your scenes on sand as well. And you know how difficult it is to kind of run in sand. And then, oh, by the way, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, in the hundreds today and temperature wise as well. So that's that that wasn't easy because he's wearing all these furs and everything it was uh, we 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 uh, we tested his limits. Yeah, no, physically and, and mentally, I'm sure. Uh, I was going to ask, do you know if he or, or I guess really any of the actors, I mean, I guess Ron Perlman or whoever else was there. Did you have some of the actors sit down and actually go into the game, be it Monster Hunter World or other games to kind of get a sense of what that sort of movement would look like for their particular weapons? Everybody, everybody immersed themselves in the world of the game. And even people who were not game players, um, what we did was we had... Um, we had play outs of the game made so that everyone could see what the game was, feel what it was like to play the game. We'd have someone who came in and kind of played the game and then would sit with my production designer or my director of photography so the production designer could really see in great detail, you know, what the locations look like in the video game. The director of photography could see what the photography was like so that he could emulate that. Um, and then the actors, it was very important for them to see their characters because you know, Mila's character is the only, she's the, she's the newbie. She's the new character that you create when you play the video game. 
but everyone else is a non-player character that you would encounter when you play Monster Hunter World. Um, and we wanted to be, again, as close as possible to those characters from the game and, and do real due diligence. So it was very important for the actors to, to see their characters in the game. And, and a good example of that is um, we had this wonderful um, Japanese actress, Hirona, who plays the handler. And she just, she went into great detail. And the handler has a very specific way of moving. You know, she's quite low and she, and uh, we, we blocked out one scene um, and then we we're going to shoot it. And Hirona had kind of, the cameraman didn't know where she was because she'd gone down, you know, how the handler kind of is slightly lower. And she emulated the movement of the handler from the video game perfectly. I mean, it was fantastic. So God knows how many hours of footage she'd watched to kind of really nail her character. Yeah, I mean, and, and all the all the actors did the, the same thing as well. You know, they were all very, very into it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's two different classes out in the field. I mean, you have the hunters who we're familiar with, but the handlers are not there to fight. You know, they will get messed up badly. <laughs> so she needs to be careful. You know, you don't yeah. you, you don't want to get blasted out of the sky by a Rathalos, although she almost did in the game, but saved by a hunter of course um yeah well we we you know we uh we do kind of uh, they do get a little tangled up in the action in the movie yeah. which i thought was really fun yeah good. um because we have Le Leia is there as well um with aiden um which is which is great and uh it was really fun the first time we had all of those actors together in their costumes which are kind of like so so accurate from the game and uh, it was it was a really nice moment. I mean, it was it was great. I think for Fujioka San and Sujimoto San as well to see their world come to life in our physical world as well, because they created all of this, but in a computer. You know, to actually see the costumes rendered for real, and then to be able to pick up and hold and swing the weapons as well. I mean, I think that was a that was great for them to experience. Yeah, yeah. So. Um... You're, you know, certainly been known to be able to do long franchises before. This is your first step in the Monster Hunter franchise. If you have the opportunity to keep it, you know, we know there's the desert. We know there's a jungle area. Are there any other locations or monsters, you know, that you feel comfortable saying are not in the movie that you might want to bring well, in in the future? I mean, we haven't, uh, you know, I, 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 I loved, um, I loved all the snow and ice in Iceborne. I mean, I thought that was great. You know, and I'm from the north of England, so I really like the cold. <laughs> that, so, that feels like home. <laughs> and I, I feel like, you know, the actors, I we punished them so hard on this movie with these super hot locations that I think, you know, if we were to do another one, maybe I have to punish them with super cold locations. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the ice locations. Extreme. Why not? I yeah. mean, you know, there are nice beach areas, right? Pleasant jungles that are not, you know, 100 degrees. <laughs> there, there, were some, there were some more pleasant locations on this movie as well. As there's the whole kind of oasis setting where you meet yeah. the Acerops and they're all grazing. And, sure. uh, you know, that was, that, was a, that, was a, that, was a nice, that was a nice location. Sure. Would you say you have a favorite monster from the series overall? I, I love the Nasilla. I have yeah. to say, I mean, they're so creepy and weird. And, you know, obviously they access a kind of primal fear that we all have of, of like people don't like creepy crawlies. They don't like spiders, you know, and that's kind of the basis for the Nacilla, I guess, is it's kind of a giant spider beast. But it, it goes so far beyond that. You know, the the design of it, I just think is stunning, you know. Um, and then the detail on it, the the fact that it kind of wears a, a gypsaros skin yeah. on it, you know, that it wears, it, it's cloaked because it wears the skin of another animal. It's just foul and disgusting and wonderful, all kind of mixed together. And then these big spikes of poison that accumulate on its back. I mean, the creativity that goes into the creation of these creatures is just fantastic, which is why, you know, I really, you know, I, I wanted to work as closely as I could with the creators to kind of do their world justice. But for me, the Nasilla, it's scary and it's creepy and it's stunning and the design work is so cool. And the noise it makes is just deeply worrying. It's all, it's, it's a great package. It's still scary to fight. It, it's very confusing. It can sleep you, it can poison you, it can shoot you in a web, all of those yes. things. Uh, yeah. It slingshots itself across the screen. You don't know where it's going to go. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a fun part of the movie where we we have the Nacilla in it. I mean, they were really great creatures to work with.
Yeah. Um, good segue. We've got some questions from social media that we're going to check in on. So we've got somebody here from Twitter, uh, user at Master Queps, and he wants to know, how did you choose the monsters to put in the film? Um, the monsters were chosen um, partly um, with the help of, of Capcom. You know, we wanted to use fan favorites um, from the, you know, from the entire history of the, the game. And uh, obviously leaning quite heavily on Monster Hunter World because that was the biggest game by far. So that was the one that most people um, were familiar with. Um, so that, you know, creatures like the Rathalos and Diablos were kind of easy choices because they've been the backbone in many ways of the of the games. And, um, you know, the Rathalos in particular, to me, it feels like the kind of rock star of, uh, of Monster Hunter. I know there are bigger creatures and the, there are tougher creatures to kill, but I, I think he's... He's just, he's the Lord of the skies and I love that. Um, and then I wanted to kind of reach back and and pull out some some history from Monster Hunter from some of the earlier games. And that's where we came up with the Nasilla and the Cephalos as well. We need, for the Cephalos, we needed another creature that would live under the ground because uh, we use it in quite a surprising way. And uh, you know, that's a particularly kind of striking looking creature. And then yeah. we also wanted to, we wanted to reflect um, the kind of non-combat part of the game as well. A lot of the game is, at least when I played it the first time, was just wandering around, marveling at the world, and and just reminding people that you know these creatures, you know they they're territorial and they only attack if you kind of go into their territory. And a lot of the creatures, you know, they're herbivorous, so, so um, they're they're herbivores. They're kind of they're not going to threaten you, and um, you know that's where we. We wanted to use something like the Apsaros because, you know, they can become deadly, you know, if you provoke them or if you get caught in a stampede, which is what happens in the movie. But a lot of the time, they're just beautiful creatures that are not threatening and they're they're gorgeous to look at. And we definitely wanted those those moments, that kind of sense of wonder um, that I had felt when I first played the game. You know, we wanted those moments in the movie and and that kind of creature helped us achieve that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I felt I felt when I played the game for the first time, I felt like Sam Neill's character in Jurassic Park. You know that great <laughs> moment, that great moment where he sees a dinosaur for the first time. Yeah, and 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 the way it's cut, you see his face, but you don't see what he's looking at. And then you kind of camera comes around and it reveals. And that's I felt like I felt like oh, I'm Sam Neill here. When I first placed Monsanto, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Yeah. You know, I should be so lucky to turn this into a movie. And the um, and 12 years it, later, I got to ever since. And the, the game controls in such a way too. even such a simple herbivore creature, just killing it, just knowing what button to press and then put your weapon away and then carve its meat. It's a little bit of an accomplishment the first time you carve some meat and cook a steak, right? It's oh, not God, easy yes. in the game. No, it's, it's 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 secretly it's one of my favorite bits of the game. I think, you know, the whole the whole cooking meat and uh, getting it right. You know, I've become a much better barbecuer in real life, having played Monster Hunter, that's for yeah. sure. And, and you know, that's something we wanted to emulate in the movie. You know, you've got, uh, you've got the classic cooking scene with Mila and Tony cooking up some good meat. Yeah, the, the original design behind the game, they had this concept of not everybody that plays this game is going to be comfortable hunting monsters. So while everybody's off hunting, maybe one person's just fishing, cooking up meat gathering healing supplies. It's different now, but if you go back and like the real, like 12 years ago, like on the original Mod Center for PlayStation 2, that was what it was like. If you had a friend that liked cooking meat, like like you, Paul, that would have been amazing. I'd bring you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can cook a great steak now, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. favorite way to cook it, on a, on a grill, a cast iron pan, or, or how else? No, on a grill, it's got to have flame. Yeah. I mean, otherwise you're not cooking. You're not cooking monster meat. And how well done? Well done? No. <laughs> no. Always in real life or in the game. In the game, I've got it pretty spot on. But in real life, it's always medium rare. You know, I spend a lot of time in France, so unless there's a lot of blood pouring out of it, it doesn't doesn't work for me. Agreed. Well agreed. Um, one question you touched on a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate. This is from Twitter user at Sirshup. Uh, where else in the Monster Hunter world would you like to explore? 
Um, well, definitely, I'd like to go to those kind of icy landscapes. That would be fantastic. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, what I'd like to do is also kind of explore the world of the ancient civilization more. You know, it's yeah. something that that is kind of part of it's it's integral to this movie. We we touch on it, and um, but it's it's a fascinating thing that's run through all of the all of the games. You know, you you you're in this amazing world, and you think you know about it, and then you discover these ruins of this more advanced civilization. You know, sometimes you go inside and there are tra tr tr kind of tricks and traps that you fall into and there are creatures inside as well. Um, you know, this ancient civilization and, and what it was and what it was about and the idea of the great dragon war, you know, um, and Fatalis. You know, there's a lot of mythology in the game that I think would be really fun to kind of dive into. Yeah. And, and nothing's really set in stone. I mean, from a creative standpoint, nobody's to say what's real and what isn't real. It's, it's always left at that sort of vague, you know, almost mythological level. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much detail there is in there, you know, and, uh, and at the same time, it's not specific, you know, it leaves right. a lot up to your imagination. Yeah. Yeah. We have uh, one question from Instagram from Filippo D. Pillis. And he wants to know, what can we expect in terms of visuals and stunts? Uh, you can expect the best fighting I've ever put on screen, that's for sure, because oh, I've, wow. I've got Mila and Tony Jaa mixing it up. I mean, it's, they're terrific together. I mean, the two of them actually have great, great chemistry. You know, some, of my, some of my favorite bits of the movie are just the two of them together, not fighting, not taking on monsters, but, you know, just him kind of educating her as to the world and how it works. You know, they they actually, and they have a lot of humor together as well. Um, but in terms of fight scenes, I mean, they're just terrific. Seeing the two of them go head to head, it's great. They just beat the living hell out of one another. It's fantastic. <laughs> and, you know, and both Mila and Tony obviously do, you know, nearly all of their own stunts. Um, so it's wonderful to work with two actors that are that committed and you can just really shoot it for real. You know, Tony's just running up walls for real, doing these backflips. Just fantastic. You know, we'd have wires available and, it, uh, you know, we'd, I'd always explain the stunt scenes to him and he and he'd go, no, I, don't, I think I can do that without a wire. <laughs> and of course, you know, a big part of the games and the way you can kill a lot of these creatures is you have to mount them. You have to get on top sure. of them and they're big creatures as well. So there's a lot of kind of aerial stuff in the movie. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of flying through the air and trying to stay on the back of creatures that are trying to throw you off. Um, the, there's some really big fights in, in the movie. I'm very, very proud of it. I mean, it's, it's hard to take down these creatures and we really reflect that, you know, it's not, it's not easy. You know, the fights are long, and involved and quite often, you know, end in failure and yeah. you have to go back and try again. I mean, that's like the first time, you know, they try and take down a monster, it doesn't work out, you know, and they've got to go back, got to go away. And we introduced the theme that's so important to the game as well, this idea that to kill a monster, you need a monster, you know, to kill a, like a more advanced monster, you need to go and get a more basic monster. You need to craft weaponry, you need to craft armor. Um, that's something that we, we play on a lot. Yeah. And, and failure is a big part of the experience. I, I would say when people are learning to play the game for the first time, you probably fail more often than you succeed. Well, um, exactly. And yeah. um, that's, you know, that's very much the kind of backbone of the story is that, you know, the, these characters, you know, they get their hats handed to them quite a lot by the creatures. Yeah, no, it's, it's clever. It's cool that you would incorporate almost like a subtle detail of a gameplay that you wouldn't necessarily know into that, you know, it's like, oh, I guess we got to start grinding out, you know, Apseros or Nursilla or Cephalos or whatever you would be starting at the base level. I'm sure if you had 10 hours, they would have gone the whole way up the tree. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we, you know, obviously we, you know, we don't have 10 hours, but, yeah. uh, you know, we've got all the classic scenes where you, you know, yeah. you as a character have to go and cut something off a creature. Yeah. You know, we have Mila doing that. We have Tony doing that, you know, which, um, you know, I think are great, great nods to the game. Sure. Um, if you had, if you had to give fans one fact that they may not know about a monster, what would it be? So a hidden secret, hidden bit, bit of lore. Well, I would say definitely the, uh, the toenails of the Diablos. I mean, sure. I was shocked when I, <laughs> when I, I'm like, really, we got it. We, and, and I think the funny thing is, I think on their base model, the, probably the, the claws were pointed. 
and then they had as as they had kind of a uh, you know adapted the creature and kind of worked on the animation they probably t- made them more rounded and we'd based our design on their original design which they had then deviated from but that's you know i'm always so stressed when a diablos bursts out of the ground and is trying to kill me and i'm sure everyone else is as well it's like the the, the anyone i don't think anyone's looking at its toenails but sure. if you do they're rounded and not pointed very good. Um, so let's say you fell through the same portable uh, portal that Artemis did, and you had to live in the Monster Hunter world, right? You can do anything. What would you do? I'd go and make friends with Tony Jaa. That's for <laughs> damn sure. I'd need to stand behind him. Yeah. Maybe Ron, Ron Perlman as well. He's, he's a good guy to stand behind. Yeah. I would not be a hunter myself. That's not my game. I, I, I could cook. Seems like you would cook too, maybe. Oh, I would definitely, I would be a good cook. I could hang out yeah. with Mouskula Chef and yeah. uh, cook up some tasty delights. And uh, I could also, you know, I could write in my journal like the handler. That's sure. For sure. Yep. Yeah, I, I would go with either one or the other, either cooking, support, handling. The, I, I could do paperwork. I'm pretty good at it. That's, I've, I've got training. Um, maybe the heavy bowgun, long way like you. I'm okay maybe with that, but, but that's it. Um, okay, so um, we've had a, a, a great conversation, I guess, what I'd like to know is, do you have any final words uh, to the fans of the Monster Hunter series as a whole? Um, I, you know, this is a movie that's made by fans of the game. You know, me, Mila, um, you know, we, we genuinely love the game. And I think we've done the best possible job of bringing it to a big screen. You know, we've worked so closely with the creators to kind of bring the love that they have for the world into the movie as well. And uh, and the movie's like it's a nonstop roller coaster. You know, you got two hour popcorn action entertainment. Um, I think it's a it's a great fun movie, and it's one that does justice to the Monster Hunter world as well. You know, there's a lot of fine detail, a lot of Easter eggs hidden in the movie. So it's kind of something that you could definitely have kind of repeated viewing of. Yeah, no, I mean it absolutely seems like a a labor a labor of love. Twelve years in the making. Um, getting that level yeah. of detail down <laughs> to the toenails is, is really something else. And you, I have to give you credit again. You didn't have to play it safe. Um, you know, with the Admiral, you're giving him the switch ax. I don't even know how that weapon works. So, you know, you could have just given him another great sword, but you went with one of the most complicated things. So, so absolutely credit on that. So, um, Thank you so well, much. That's one, of, that's one of the things yeah. we wanted to do as well, you know, because yeah. when you play the game, you have your favorite creatures, but also you have your favorite weaponry, yeah. your favorite armor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was something we talked very closely with with Capcom about. It's like, what are people's favorite weapons? Because obviously they have, uh, you know, a lot of that knowledge. Yeah. Um, well, I have to thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I don't know that any director of anything related to video games has ever spent like a full hour talking directly to a video game audience quite like this, you know? So thank you. Um, this is, this is really great. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. And I know, pleasure. uh, we do have some footage from, uh, the creators of the game, um, that I think we're going to be switching over to relatively soon. So take it over now. Hi. This is Sujimoto, the producer of the Monster Hunter game series. I'm Kaname Fujioka, the executive director for Monster Hunter World. Pleased to meet you. Nursilla is an extremely popular monster globally. To introduce Nursilla into the setting of the film, some new creative elements were added. Many of them are shown on screen at once, and if you look closely, each one has slightly different characteristics, like shape, size, and coloring. Please enjoy these minute details that were added. The film director really stuck closely to the game monster's ecosystems, designs, and expressions. You might not notice when you watch the movie, but critical details were maintained. For example, Black Diablos is actually female. Its visual impression is so powerful on screen that you may not notice these subtle details.
A wide variety of game weapons appear in the movie. The filmmakers actually made some amazingly detailed weapons for the movie inspired in great detail by the original game ones. I hope fans really enjoy these details. Because the movie is a combination of live action and CG, the filmmakers put a lot of detail into the CG monsters. The director and SFX studio really wanted to stay true to the source material, so we had lots of back and forth conversations, especially on the monster's designs and ecology. Such as, why is this part of the monster shaped this way? Like his claws. The filmmakers really worked to incorporate our feedback on the monsters through several rounds. So I feel the monsters are well done with incredible detail and blend in well into the live action world. I was really impressed with the visual effects. It felt great to see our monsters represented with Hollywood's level of visual effects. Dual blades are one of the most popular weapon categories throughout the Monster Hunter series. I heard Miss Mila's favorite weapon was dual blades. Dual blades have many movements that make attacks look incredibly well choreographed. I hope you really enjoy watching Miss Mila handle the dual blades in the movie. I've been using hammer. I've been using lance since the very first Monster Hunter game. I liked bow. There was a time I was using bow a lot in the Monster Hunter games. I really liked it in the movie too, because the movie does a great job of using bow's special characteristics. It really matches the game well, and the hunter was completely natural using a massive bow in the movie, so I have to say bow is my favorite movie weapon. When the film adaptation conversation initially came to us a long time ago, one of my requests was to use weapons that are unique to the Monster Hunter games. Generally, weapons are made out of metal, but the filmmakers decided to use the natural elements like bones and other monster materials to make parts of the weapons. They also used the greatsword, giant jaw blade, Ohagito, in the movie. I've been involved in the Monster Hunter series since the first game, so I was very grateful to see them use the greatsword that has been in the Monster Hunter game series for so long. I feel that the story and script did a great job incorporating how you have to hunt and take a monster down, using different monster parts and materials, wearing the monster down, and eventually defeating the monster. So you can expect there to be some very Monster Hunter-ness in the movie. The director, Paul, and the production team were very respectful about the things that make Monster Hunter unique and really tried hard to incorporate them into the movie experience. You can get a sense of how dynamic the world of Monster Hunter is in this movie. I think you'll be amazed just how powerful the monsters appear to be in the movie. Please enjoy it in the theater. This is the very first time Monster Hunter has been made into a live action film. In the game series, the monsters really are our main characters. The filmmakers realize this, so they put so much effort into the monsters and CG. So please, enjoy them in the movie. We always immensely appreciate the support of our fans for the Monster Hunter franchise. In the past, now, and in the future. So everybody, that was Fujioka and Sujimoto san um, Amazing seeing them there. And so thank you again, Paul. This is SD Shepard. Um, any last words about the movie? We made a big movie with big creatures in big landscapes. Hopefully everyone can go see it on a big screen. Okay. And when can fans see it? Uh, soon. Opening <laughs> soon. in December. Different, different countries, yeah. different dates, but uh, it's coming to cinemas very soon. Awesome. Okay, thank you all again so much. Uh, thank you everybody for watching. Have a great night and check out the movie soon. Cheers.